Justin Radek, a lawyer and a former ethics advisor to the Department of Justice, joins me today to talk about the Boston bombings. Thank you for joining us on RT. I want to start with the charges that the U.S. Uh, said they will charge the uh, suspect with, uh, weapons, possession of weapons of mass destruction. What, what is that? Well, I wish I could tell you more about that, but I haven't actually seen that charge leveled against anybody. Um, it's uh, obvious that they are considering the weapon of mass destruction to be uh, the bombs, which they termed improvised explosive devices. So they gave it this military kind of term. Um, for what most people would consider a bomb. Um, and weapons of mass destruction obviously sounds pretty, pretty horrific. Um, but th they were talking about homemade bombs, pressure, mm -hmm. cookers, and now they're talking about weapons of mass destruction. I mean, how, how, how is that even possible when you're talking about homemade Bombs. I honestly believe that it's because the defendant or the suspect here um, is Muslim. Obviously, uh, there have been a number of white people who've committed massacres lately in Aurora, Colorado. Um, Holmes shot up the movie theater. Adam Lanza shot up all those children at Sandy Hook Elementary School. And none of those people were charged as terrorism or with terrorism-type charges. We, we also saw a lot of the media play into that right after the bombings. A lot of people were talking about possible connections to different people, different countries even. What do you, what do you make of that? I think immediately there was very much a desire to frame this as an act of terrorism and therefore to try to put the label on here on these men that they were Islamic jihadists and I mean the only positive spin I could give that is that they were trying to people were trying to distance themselves from it to make it feel more normal. But the more sinister interpretation is, obviously, we have a lot of Islamophobia and anti-Muslim bias in this country, as evidenced by the fact that the, the man charged for this massacre is being treated as a terrorist and charged with, you know, carrying weapons of mass destruction, um, whereas other people would get different charges, like Timothy McVeigh did for his bomb-making. And, and because of his background, maybe, there was a lot of, uh, or there were a lot of arguments leading up, first reading his rights, um, then to charging him as a enemy combatant or as a U.S. citizen, and now uh, all the arguments about um, his rights and uh, the interrogation. I mean, where is the legal system in all of this? Well, the legal system should never put up with that. I mean, it, it, I think most people, most reasoned people knew that he should be Mirandized, and maybe there was a small window um, during which they could ask him about immediate public safety concerns. Um, but that was it. And then they needed to Mirandize him and read him his rights. In terms of trying to um, call him an enemy combatant, that is specifically so they would not have to Mirandize him. And we've seen that in other cases um, with Jose Padilla, uh, where they initially called him an enemy combatant, and he didn't get to see a lawyer for some three and a half years. So all along, there's been this effort to treat him differently than we would an ordinary criminal who should be tried in federal criminal court. And as you say, that's the background, maybe, that uh, his background that is weighing into this, that's actually uh, leading into the events or leading into the conclusion that's, ha you know. Not even so much his um, background as immigrating from Chechnya. I think it was more discovering that he and his brother were both um, Muslim and discovering that the brother, not the actual defendant, but that the older brother had been watching um, radicalized video propaganda. I actually watch the same stuff as part of my job um, in national security and human rights. Um, so that doesn't necessarily mean you're a terrorist. 
Russia tried to warn the U.S., tried to tell them that mm -hmm. um, they should check into this. But the minute the news came out, everybody was talking about his background. Everybody was even confusing Chechnya with the Czech Republic. Mm -hmm. What do you make of all of this? I think it was a massive ignorance on the part of Americans in terms of both geography and religion. Obviously, Islam is a peaceful religion. Um, it doesn't believe in bloodshed, um, but also, yeah, the geographical confusion. I think, again, it was to immediately put this person in the category of other. This person is not like us. This person should be treated as an enemy combatant. They should not have their rights. They don't deserve to have their rights. I mean, normally we operate on innocent until proven guilty in this country. But for um, this suspect, they're reversing the usual presumption. And that was clear from the get go. And the surveillance state not only failed, apparently the FBI failed, because Russia tipped off the FBI years ago that they should be concerned, perhaps, about this older brother after his visit um, to Russia, I, and I think Chechnya, too. I'm not clear on that. But um, someone dropped the ball, and, uh, you know, I placed that at the feet of the FBI and the, and the American government. But yet. He, uh, the U.S. didn't do anything about it, and they they sort of uh, a blame game started the minute after, mm -hmm. soon after the Boston bombings, mm -hmm. and they were talking about him being in the U.S. for just a short period of time, mm -hmm. not having lived he and his brother in the U.S. for a long time, which makes the story completely different. It really does. I mean, the narrative that they tried to feed everyone from the get-go was that he had they had recently come to the U.S. and that they were radical Islamic jihadists. And as the story evolved and you learned, wow, they came over here, the suspect who's been charged was nine years old. And then you get senators saying, like Senator Grassley saying, uh, we need to be tougher on immigration. Well, what are you going to do? Ask a nine-year-old if they have a propensity for terrorism? Um, and the younger brother seemed kind of to be following the older brother. If anyone was more radicalized, it seemed like perhaps the older brother w was. Would you consider this a, a case of domestic terrorism be because they, they've been living in the U.S. for a long time? I, I would, in, in terms of Oklahoma City bombing by Timothy McVeigh, was domestic terrorism. But I don't think he was actually charged with anything like weapons of mass destruction, even though he improvised filling a truck with fertilizer and cre causing far more deaths uh, you know, by an order of magnitude compared to the three people that unfortunately you know, died in this incident. Um, so you could call it domestic terrorism, but the charges for McVeigh certainly didn't sound almost like war, war-like charges. The the U.S. since 9/11 beefed up its spending on mm -hmm. security. Um, yet, as something as big as the Boston bombings happen, has the U.S. failed? I believe this was a massive failure of the su the surveillance state that we've created in America. Since 9-11, we have spent over $700 billion on national security, and a lot of that is surveillance, with video cameras, with massive data collection, with fusion centers, and none of those have helped to deter or detect any terrorist plot. And while the surveillance video was useful in reconstructing what happened after the fact, it didn't prevent it. Do you think the U.S. will turn to more surveillance? They will increase the surveillance in the U.S. after this attack? Unfortunately, I think that will be the myopic reaction in America. Not to say why, why did surveillance fail to detect, but rather to Yes, have even more surveillance, um, which would be a really unfortunate outcome. The U.S. seemed uh, divided over the Boston. I mean, not over uh, what should happen and how, mm -hmm. but uh, over the legality of uh, the procedures. And uh, while some congressmen called to as a, again to call him as an enemy combatant and to try him as an enemy combatant, others were like, "We cannot." 
um, th there is a constitution and we should j just uphold the constitution. W where is this going to take the debate in the U.S., do you think? You know, we've been having this debate since 9-11. I happen to have been the whistleblower in the case of the American Taliban, John Walker Lind, and that was a few months after 9-11. And back then, they were talking about whether or not to charge him or call him an enemy combatant or an unlawful belligerent, and whether or not to Mirandize him. I mean, that's what I eventually blew the whistle on, was the fact that they would not let him see his lawyer. And then when they eventually did Mirandize him, they told him, but there are no lawyers here in Afghanistan. So this debate's been going on. I feel like the law is pretty subtle that you can't just designate so, you know, someone, an American in particular, as an enemy combatant and do whatever you want with them. Um, you have to go to court. And I think Padilla's lawyers understood that this was going to eventually end up in court. And that's why they finally allowed him counsel and charged him. In this case, they allowed him that. Do you think this debate is going maybe to lead to more division in the U.S. over cases like this? Who's going to win such a debate? Right now, unfortunately, the people who've been dismantling our Constitution and due process rights um, for defendants and for all American citizens in terms of civil rights and liberties, they're going to be the loser. In this case, I think there will be renewed measures in, con in Congress for designating people as enemy combatants and new definitions of terrorism that um, they're not going to be explicit, you know, by saying, oh, okay, if a Muslim person does it, but they'll say Al Qaeda and associated forces and anyone connected thereto, or something that makes it so broad it could encompass someone watching a video, which, like I said, I watched it this morning because I wanted to see what video the brother had apparently watched that inspired him to do this, supposedly. Some people say that this incident and other incidents will probably... Um, the U.S. will witness more Islamophobia. There, uh, there will be Islamophobia rise in the U.S. post such incidents. Do you agree with them? Unfortunately, I do, because, um, as you noted, from the very beginning, the narrative started to form to place these uh, suspects, um, one or more, into another camp, and in particular, into a terrorist camp. And while the president initially was very careful not to call this an act of terrorism and not to use that word casually, by the next day he was calling it an act of terror, and there started to be rumors about um, them having come from Chechnya, um, which is not normally that. It has a large Islamic presence, but is not normally associated with al-Qaeda. Um, so it, I feel like from the very beginning, they, there was the best case scenario for in a lot of people's minds would to have them be Muslims who had become radicalized um, and did this as part of jihad. I think that was there from the get-go. And unfortunately, I think this will only increase people's tendencies towards Islamophobia.